morning. How are you? I hope you're well. I'm James Woolman. I'm a entrepreneur. I'm an author. Um, I've been a forecaster. I'm a forecaster too. I've been a forecaster since 2004. In around 2010, uh, I'd been following the, this thing called the experience economy for a couple of years, and I decided I wanted to write a book about it, and I wanted to call it Stuffocation. Uh, we're all stuffocating, suffocating from too much stuff. And actually, I wanted to call the book something else. I wanted to call it something about um, the rise of the experientialist or experientialism or something, because I saw this, uh, what I think is one of the most important shifts of our time, this shift from materialism to what I call experientialism. Instead of looking for happiness, identity and status in stuff, in material things, I think we're finding happiness, identity and status in experiences instead. And um, my bosses thought I was wrong. Um, uh, I couldn't get an agent at first. Uh, then I got an agent. Uh, and then uh, I almost sold the book. Well, my agent almost sold the book in New York and in London. And uh, we didn't quite sell the book. Uh, about 75 different publishers came back and said, uh, basically, the, the feedback was kind of almost the same everywhere. They're like, great idea. Congrats. Yeah, love it. But we don't think it's true. And it got really close. In fact, the people that took uh, Malcolm Gladwell's The Tipping Point in the States sent back these uh, really nice emails from New York saying it's getting really great reads. And it got to this thing called an acquisition meeting uh, where they uh, basically all sit around and decide whether they're going to do it or not. And uh, that was about a, I had a month of these emails, like kind of like, it's almost like it's weird tease, right? And uh, then they said, no, because it's a great idea, but it's not true. Uh, similar thing happened in the UK. Uh, with one particular company uh, publishing house where they decided to take it. Um, and then the uh, the big boss came back from holiday and said, we're not. So that was um, crushing. But in the end, I self-published the book. And uh, it got picked up by a few places like um, The Sun, the Sunday Times and The Financial Times and Fast Company in the US. And then uh, it sold some copies and it kind of started to take off. And then Penguin bought it, which was obviously wonderful for me. Um, and what was really interesting, I think that's happened since then it, it is that there's been, um, organizations like the world economic forum, McKinsey, um, large investment firms have, have, have come out, if you like, in support of this idea that we are moving from caring about things to caring about experiences instead. And obviously we talk about the rise of the experience economy. And um, when I would give talks about this, like, you know, in, in person, in, in, uh, in sort of private members clubs or interviewed on the uh, BBC or ABC or MSNBC or whatever, people would often say to me, they would tend to say to me, okay, great, James, this, this is really interesting. What does this mean for us? And the book was, was two things. It was firstly this idea of this big trend, the shift in, in where we were going in the world. But also if you wanted to be happier, you should focus less on stuff and more on experiences because there's like seven reasons. There's a whole bunch of reasons why. Um, why experience is better than material goods that make us happy. And uh, it's like, it, it's confirmed in the, in the science research. Okay. Um, but also from a business perspective, if you care about making uh, your employees or your, your customers happy, right, what should you provide them with? And the truth is I didn't have a great answer. My answer was like, experience is not stuff. Um, but people say, what kind of experiences should a person choose? And I didn't know the answer. So, I went away and researched this essentially, and this is my new book. Uh, you can probably see it there, Time and How to Spend It. You see, look, it disappears and comes back in. It's fun, isn't it? Sorry, I don't get out much. Um, and Time and How to Spend It is my attempt to answer the question, what kind of experiences should a person choose? When you think about this, it's, it's well, you, when I think about this, stuff occasion was how should you spend your money, not stuff experiences. And when you think about what kind of experiences you should choose, the thing that you're spending there is, of course, you're spending money often, but the most, the more important thing you're spending is time. So how you should spend your time becomes, I mean, it's, it's an essential question, right? And so I talked to anthropologists and sociologists and economists and um, psychologists, behavioral psychologists, evolutionary psychologists, et cetera, at Stanford, at Princeton, at Cambridge, at Oxford, at the LSC, at MIT, all sorts of places. I, I talked to people much cleverer than me and I distilled their, their ideas into this book and into a checklist um, so that it would be simple for people to figure out how to spend their time. And I think one of the interesting learnings was that just as with food, you know how there's junk food, 
Um, there's foods that aren't very good for you, you know, uh, processed foods, uh, um, you know, very sugary foods. And there are superfoods, you know, there's, there's broccoli, kale, there's cashew nuts, there's blueberries, there's peaches, there's bananas, there's stuff that's, you know, that, that's good for you. And there's stuff that's not very good for you. It's the same with time. There are junk food ways of spending your time and there are superfood ways of spending your time. Um, and just in the same way that, you know, superfoods will give you the opportunity to have good skin and good muscles and the opportunity, you know, the, the ability to concentrate and to be good at what you do in the same way, if you spend your time, and this is about your leisure time, it's about your work time, it's about your time, you know, it's about the thing that you have. If you spend your time in a, in, in, uh, in a better way, you are more likely to uh, be able to be creative, to be productive, to be happier, to be resilient, and to be successful in life. So if you look at the data, it's very clear that, um, you know, if you want to be successful, um, you need to be resilient. Resilient is, is really important for us. But also, if you want to be successful, there's, there's research from people like Sean Aker at Harvard, um, Laura King at the University of Missouri, that shows very clearly that the people who tend to be um, successful tend to be happy first. So this really interesting causal link between happiness and success. And most of us think that, wow, I'll be successful and then I'll be happy. You know, I'll get the, I don't know, the girl, the guy, the job, the exit, the, um, the business that runs like this, and then everything will fall into place. Actually, it's the other way around. The causal link is be happy first. People, they, they talk about positive effect, but it's happiness in, in, in everyday language. If you um, if you are happier, you are more likely to be successful. So therefore, um, it seems clear to me that you should spend your time. You should uh, think about how you spend your time, just as you would with food. Try and eat more of the superfoods, eat more, you know, good for you foods. So you should spend more of your um, time on things that are more likely to make you happy and resilient and successful. And if you do that, you are effectively increasing your odds of success so uh, the checklist is um and i wanted to make this really simple because you know you look at behavioral science most people forget most stuff um you will forget this talk so however much however hard i'm trying here you will forget what i said sadly um but hopefully you'll remember this checklist and the checklist i think is simple it's stories s t o r i e s so seven commandments seven rules that you can think about on a tuesday morning on a thursday evening at the weekend the way you spend your vacation uh what you do with your weekends what you do with your time your leisure time your work time and um these stories each of these stands for something so um and each is backed by evidence it's backed by uh scientifically researched evidence and um there are frameworks within each within the book um and they are story transformation outside and offline relationships intensity extraordinary and status and significance it was kind of interesting about them is they kind of support each other um yeah, but, but, you know, time is short. Let me, what I do in, in, in courses that I do when I'm teaching companies, whether I'm working with people to, to teach them to, to design experiences better or to how they should spend their time better, we run through them all, but obviously time is tight here. So why don't I just, I'll pick one. Um, I'm going to take the first one, story. And story is super interesting, partly because um, I remember when I was researching and writing this book as a, as a startup that I was working on was failing and it was weird because it was failing, but I wasn't unhappy that it was failing. And part of me was a little bit kind of curious. I mean, obviously I was kind of unhappy that it wasn't really working out the way I'd hoped it to work out. Um, but the journey was okay. So, so story works in an in a amazing way. So hu the thing that separates humans from other species, one of the crucial things is that we tell um, uh, complex stories and we have this flexibility with language to tell really interesting complex stories and when you tell a story the magic of a story is it leads almost directly to happiness resilience and success it's like those um so if you ever watched when you were a kid those domino programs where someone set up a domino line and kind of like one domino hits the other etc so when you tell a story it set, sets off a domino line that leads to happiness and success and resilience. And the way it works is you tell a story, um, the person who's listening 
there's something called mirror neurons fire up. It's basically the neurons fire up the same as yours. So if you're telling a story about the time that you were cycling on a bicycle and you're going down a hill and you suddenly, your, your wheel started to wobble and you, you, you know, you caught the edge of the road and you fell off, you tumbled over um, the uh, handlebars, the, the other person's mirror neurons fire, they can picture that happening, okay? So when you tell um, a story, the mirror neurons fire, neuroscientists believe that is the physical basis for empathy. Empathy leads to connection, connection to relationships, relationships to happiness, and relationships to resilience, relationships to success as well, and happiness to success. So let me make that clear. So a story leads to empathy. Story via mirror neurons leads to empathy, empathy to connection, connections to relationships, relationships to happiness and resilience and happiness to success. So when you tell any story, that's great for you because um, it connects you to other people and, and does all this good stuff. But there's a particular type of story that is more likely to fire up a person's mirror neurons for a whole bunch of reasons, for personal reasons, and for very deep, um, I want to say anthropological reasons, but kind of, if you look at our, um, the structure of our, our societies and our ancestors, all of our ancestors have gone through a similar journey to every single one of us. And this story is called the hero's journey. And the hero's journey, this is a type of story, it's a shape of story, it's, a, it's the Hollywood story, it's the story of Jesus, it's the story of Moana, it's the story of 1917, it's the story of Cinderella. And the way this story works in the simplest format, to put it into kind of a, you know, a simple version here now, is you get person, problem, solution. Um, Kurt Vonnegut called it the man in the man in whole story it doesn't have to be a man, doesn't have to be a whole. Um, and he was talking about this back in the, like the 40s and the 50s. And he carried on talking about it. So basically you get Cinderella, um, of course her mum and her dad die, she's left with the, the, the stepmother, everything goes wrong um, for her, but she meets the, the prince and she lives happily ever after. And that same uh, arc, which you can draw this way, you can draw this way, it doesn't really matter. The, the key thing is you have a person who goes through a difficult situation, comes out the other side. And if you think about you personally, if you think about uh, our ancestors, We've all had to go through that. We've all failed in exams. We've all had stuff go wrong. Um, our ancestors had to get through cold nights, ice ages, defeat different enemies. Every culture in the world tells stories in the shape of the hero's journey. And if you think about the entrepreneur's journey, the entrepreneur's journey is the hero's journey. And if you, if you study more about the hero's journey, you'll see that that journey of a person problem, the problem is really complex. And you have this, this wonderful phase um, called the road of trials, where you have to find your tests, your allies, and your enemies. If you think about Star Wars, for example, Luke Skywalker needed Chewbacca. He needed Han Solo. He needed Princess Leia. He needed, he needed Darth Vader. He needed all those people he needed to beat. So as you go through the process of being an entrepreneur, and I'm, I'm launching a B2C and a B2B thing at the moment, and I'm advising some companies as well, and, and you need the stuff to go wrong. You need the anno annoying CTO who lets you down. You need um, you know, the client who backs out. You need the friends that neg on you, that tell you your idea is rubbish. You need the challenges with your finances. You, that's the hero's journey. That's the entrepreneur's journey. So um, what's kind of interesting, and this is coming from, in particular, a clinical psychologist in Australia who uses this hero's journey as a framework to help people feel more in control of their lives and understand where they are in order to move to the next phase. Once you, once you start to see your time in terms of the hero's journey, you start to realize the importance of the tests, the allies, the enemies, and it puts you back into the driving seat and enjoy the journey that much more. I'd really like to talk about flow and how the neuroscience of flow mirrors the shape of the hero's journey and of the entrepreneur's journey. But I think we're out of time. So um, I'll be around for questions. The key thing is, as you go through, actually as you go through life, but as you go through the journey of setting something up and creating something, there will be tests, allies and enemies and you need every single one of those to make it worthwhile and to enjoy it. So think about that story element 
And that's just one part of this stories checklist for how you spend your leisure time and how you spend the most valuable resource you have, your time. Have a great day.